communicate those research results uh, in uh, in qualified uh, journals or other or other um, publication. Uh, okay, we can start with this final session with uh, an interesting work uh, presented today by Gustavo Adolfo Tinoco Martinez. I think I I <laughs> pronounced uh, right your, your name. Yes. The design planning for future of um, Macapá metropolitan region, state of uh, Ama Amapa, Brazil, a support to explain the collaborative technical performance. Okay, Gustavo, take your time, uh, give us uh, all the all the details uh, you you think are important of this relevant experience. So you can start your presentation. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm going to share the the screen. Yes, yes. just a second. uh can you can you see yes it works okay perfect ah, okay okay just a second okay uh well, well my name is uh gustavo gustavo adolfo i'm going to be presenting to you the the this paper i'm uh i'm not not fluent uh in english so i'm going to try to do my best um Okay, um, uh, the work is uh, named Using the Geodesign to Plan the Future of Macapá Metropolitan Region, State of Amapá, Brazil, as support to expanding collab collaborative technical performance. Um, this article is a coll co collective work of Fabiana Vieira, Carolina Rocha, Ana Paleta, and Saranelli, eh, and me. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, this article describes the workshop experience uh, called Geodesign Brazil, trees for metropolitan regions developed, developed on the metropolitan region of Macapá, state of Amapá, Brazil. Uh, and also uh, its goal is to highlight the challenges and possibilities offered by digital platforms in regional scale, uh, regional scale urban plan. The methodology used on this uh, participation process, collaboration and share of ideas was the geodesign and the application done on the GISCOLAB platform uh, developed by Christian, Christian Freitas at the Geoprocessing Laboratory of the School of uh, Architecture in, uh, in the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Okay, just a brief about geodesign. Geodesign is a methodology that provides support to share creation and decision-making processes. It, it seeks to build a collective planning that stems from the information regarding the territory, resorting to the potentialities of geographic information systems. Uh, a geodesign process can be used, uh, can use data distribution models in territories so that relevant layers can be combined and used for debate, uh, which later allows to construct synthesis regarding a given field of study. Uh, and uh, the stages of geodesign are comprised of six models, uh, representation, processes, and evaluation models. Uh, which should be purely developed by technicians and change uh, change impact and decision models developed during the participatory planning workshop. Uh, okay. Uh, and the GISCOLA platform uh, focuses on developing a methodology that is uh, comprised of four stages. This is the, the four that is use the platform uh, for today. Uh, the first, uh, reading en enrichment and annotation, proposal creation, dialogues and negotiation, and final body voting. So about the, the area we are working. 
Uh, the Macapá metropolitan area is located on the stage of Amapá, north of, of Brazil, uh, with a total area of 22,000 kilometers squared. Uh, this region accounts for 40% for of the state's total territory. Uh, it is located on the left bank of the mouth of the Amazon River uh, and is composed by three, three cities, uh, Macapá, Santana and Masagão. You can see here in the map. Um, okay, uh, the population. Uh, this region accounts for 76% per of the total population of the state of Amapá. Okay, uh, well, it's cultural, uh, about cultural landscape, uh, values, contributes to tourism, uh, this region, uh, for both business as well as ecotourism. Mm -hmm. Given the, that aside from the mouth of the Amazon River, the city of Macapá is also crossed by the e Ecuador line uh, and is strongly influenced by the Mar Marajoara Island in the neighboring state of, um, pa of Pará. Mm, its vegetation is diversified. Sorry. Uh, its vegetation is diversified, including Cerrado, Savanna, uh, fir ground forest, uh, it's a typical of the Amazon forest, and a uh, floodplain forest uh, with mangrove vegetation in its shores. Uh, the state of Amapá is a um, state of Amapá was created in the Macapá. Sorry, sorry. Uh, the state of Amapá created the Macapá metropolitan area, a uh, comprise of the cities of Mac Macapá and Santana in 2003, and uh, Masagán was included in the metropolitan area in 2016. Uh, the process of creation of Macapá metropolitan area is based on lines uh, on the lines of common interest between the three cities of the metropolitan area uh, there are basic sanitation, urban mobility, health, law, law enforcement, education, housing, and integrated planning for sustainable economic, social, and territorial development. Um, this this region uh, it is a special type of ecosystem known as resaca. Uh, resaca is a regional expression used to designate an ecosystem that is typically of Amapá's shores. They are areas that fit into quaternary terrains, uh, which behave as natural water reser reservoirs, characterized as a complex, as an unique ecosystem that is subject to the regime of the tides uh, as part of an uh, intricate set of canals and streams. Uh, you can see here a picture of this region. And a problem uh, present in this area that some areas of the Resaca are occupied by irregular habitations, uh, informal workers, and employment uh, employed because uh, even though the the area, the area was uh, it's, can you see the screen? I have a problem here. Anyways, okay. Sorry. Uh, some areas of uh, Resaca are occupied by irregular habitations, uh, informal workers, and employed. Um, because even though there was uh, no access to public services on, or infrastructure, 
uh, the location was often closer to the urban center, uh, making them an attractive choice uh, for uh, build these irregular habitations uh, in this, this area. Uh, the houses built over steels, uh, palafitas, have no access to basic, uh, basic sanitation, which is a risk to both human health and the environment. Uh, now about the workshop, uh, tools and methods. methods. Uh, Ten key topics were chosen for discussion in the forum of systems that were evaluated during the collaborative process. Uh, Disarmitation, hydrography, housing, transportation, institution, commerce and industry, agriculture, energy, tourism, and culture, and create carbon credits. Mm, okay. Uh, about the data, the data, the data was retrieved from platforms belonging to public institutions and freely available for download. Uh, followed by a uh, upload to the platform using WFS Web Feature Services. Uh, the data was processed and organized into a collection of maps, and then exported to the GISCOLAB platform. Yes, okay. This is called a platform. Uh, the workshop was conducted over the course of four virtual sessions in March 2021. Uh, there was 18 people attending mostly, uh, mostly university and public service uh, personnel. A lot of them working as a technicians uh, for public offices dedicated to territorial planning. Okay. Uh, the participants were uh, divided into two groups, two work groups, uh, the group A and the group B, which work with different time horizons. Uh, the former, uh, the first one was, uh, would develop scenarios for the year 2013. Uh, and the second one, the would focus on proposal for the year uh, 2015. So, uh, day one, uh, the first stage of the workshop involved understanding the platform and its layers, after which notes were taken regarding problems and potentialities. Uh, once participants were distributed in online chat rooms, they were explained how to uh, how the GISCOLA platform works with special regard to how the spatial data for each system could be visualized. Uh, yeah, and once the reading part was done, uh, the workshop proceed with a discussion regarding the, aspect, the, ac the aspects of the area that were worth highlighting and which were not yet provided in, ter in terms of data. Uh, this process resulted in the creation of, spe of a specific notes uh, about the area, uh, and these notes were characterized as observations, problems, potentialities, and alerts uh, that the participants uh, proposed. Okay. The day two, the second session, and to evaluate the scenarios that would be uh, produced when applying traditional planning without innovative interventions on the territory, a stage defined as the non adopter. So, this was uh, mainly driven by traditional planning. And uh, the person was uh, read the notes and spatial identification. Uh, it's planned for how to build the proposals with within the platform. Uh, choose a standard colors for each system. Made proposals regarding carbon credits and polygons. Uh, check the sets of layers per system. Uh, pick the themes they deem most important for collective analysis and finally design their ideas. 
uh, for the years of two thousand thirteen and. 2050, planning has to follow traditional political actions that feature scenario designed according uh, to Brazil's, Brazil's reality. Okay. Day three. Um, the third session proposed a new scenario where um, the metropolitan uh, region of Macapá would implement proposals that had some degree of innovation. Uh, the stage referred to the late adopter. Therefore, participants were encouraged to create proposals with relevant impact uh, on the territory for each of the 10 systems. Uh, the approach used by each group would be guided by different perspectives. Uh, the group A would build proposals for the year of uh, 2013 using reading enrichment and the notes developed by the group during the early stages. And uh, the group B would use the 2030, uh, 2030 with no innovations uh, scenario created by group A as their reference, the scenario created in the previous uh, stage. So the goal of this dynamic was uh, to simulate the period between 2013 and 2015 and evaluate which changes uh, the territory would undergo in terms of planning with innovations. Um, with the, the main two compare, compare two scenarios, starting from the current reality 2021, it would be reached the year 2030-35 uh, using traditional planning. And from the 10 until 2050, the proposal will start adopting more innovative ideas. Uh, day four, last, last day. Uh, the last session had the goal of creating a scenario in which both groups uh, would build plans with several innovations, which would have a major impact on the territory if they were implemented. Uh, it was known that early adopter. Uh, it was proposed that 3% uh, each group Oh, in this last session, the team was directed to reach at least 3% of carbon crates uh, that include proposals of creation, conservation, or explanation of the areas uh, to that the groups could use uh, to do that, the groups could use a plugin on the platform that would show the percentage of usage area uh, that they were uh, proposing. At least the final two stages were dedicated to commenting and both. So uh, this stage commenting participants in participants in group A would discuss the context and scenario provided by group B, and the group B uh, would do the same based on the work provided by uh, group A. And voting in each proposal, participants from the evaluating group had the change to use uh, to issue a positive or negative vote through the like and don't like uh, resources provided in the platform. Uh, as a result, uh, a survey applied at the ending of the last workshop. Uh, the participants that presented their stances based on their knowledge of the Macapá uh, um, metropolitan area over the course of these encounters. So uh, most, of, most participants had institutional ties to public planning offices. Uh, this relates to their knowledge on the subject uh, acquired from the everyday technical work, which played a fundamental role in the decision-making processes. Uh, when, I, when questioned on their knowledge of the main characteristics of the Macapá Metropolitan Region, 
41 person replied that they did not know them, uh, the main characteristics, uh, perhaps is perhaps due to the large territorial extension of the uh, metropolitan Macapa, Macapa metropolitan area uh, and empty areas that they may have never visited before. Uh, regarding the data used, some degree of appropriation by participants participants was noted when they face the need for uh, additional spatial information. So they uploaded uh, for themselves. Uh, okay, regarding to how we see a uh, uh, they consider each uh, stage of the workshop it is possible uh, to note an increase in those who mark the that was quite easy between the first and final stage, uh, which yeah. may be a, we can we, we think that uh, that uh, may be explained by first the participants' knowledge of the of geographical information systems and geospatial software usage in their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, to the explanations on how to use the platform uh, made by uh, the mediator and uh, third the presence of mediators in each group and the video explanation on how to use the platform during the start of each encounter and finally Okay. Finally, our closing remarks. Uh, since the goal of GSI is to provide support for populations to make decisions based on critical understanding of the potentialities and problems of their, of their territories, it is important to stay alert regarding how those involved in these processes deal with spatial representation. Uh, the search for common language and shared assumptions can often uh, be obstructed using complicated digital tools or highly technical discourse with no political consciousness. In the proposition stage, it is important to discuss local potentialities. Uh, in several moments, uh, talking about issues is more effective. Uh, knowledge regarding the area discuss essential to think strategically and propose actions uh, that will not only solve something in the area but also optimize what is uh, considered positive. <coughs> Sorry. Another approach that should be taken is the assessment of the extent to which the proposed future scenarios contribute to the sustainable development goals proposed by the UN for the 2013 agenda. Uh, the geodesign process can assist in pro proposing ideas concerning the goal of the 17 objectives. Uh, the proposed scenarios uh, in this work show an increase from non adopter to early adopter with emphasis on water, the water teams, transport, parks, urban and organic agriculture uh, but there are few proposals uh, to eradicate poverty so this is uh, important to future workshops uh, so i think that's all yes well, the last one, uh, it's noticed that during the experiment, the participants behave in the same manner that they do when performing their daily activities as the state workers uh, who need to fulfill requirements, evaluate the impact and the feasibility of the proposals before registering. registering. Uh, that, that was particular notice in this workshop, very interesting. So uh, it's, it's all for me. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone have questions, please uh, 
slowly. <laughs> Gustavo, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, of course, if, if there are some questions from, uh, from the participants, then I have some comments and uh, something to ask you. Yeah, I, I have a question for Gustavo. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was very clear. And uh, thank you also again for being with us. Uh, we know that in Brazil now is the, just the middle of the night, so we appreciate that very much. And um, my question was, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned that uh, sanitation in the where the palafitas uh, are uh, is a big problem for uh, human health and environmental health. So in the final design, uh, was this issue addressed uh, in some way? uh not clearly was uh some proposals a general proposal more transportation uh uh an infrastructure but this this uh, issue wasn't addressed wasn't what that wasn't the the the, the principal uh, mm -hmm. execution and uh, you said that uh, the participant, especially technical staff from public administration, behaved and worked more or less as, as usual. But uh, uh, do you think uh, working uh, with your design methodology and tools uh, in a way was improving uh, the result of their work? Uh... I think I think so. Yes, uh, because uh, they were able to maybe expand the knowledge about uh, tools for uh, designs, tools for share proposals. Uh, so was I think was useful for for them. Uh, some of them also uh, are interested. Uh, to take a, a second stage, yes, for this area using your sign and these these methodologies. They Thank they you. were they were very very excited <laughs> for this. This is what usually happen uh, when they test uh, try for the first time. Yes, uh, the methodology. Many people think is, it is useful and. Uh, uh, a good way to work, especially for collaboration and talking with each other and learning from each other. Yes. Uh, also, in my experience, this is usually the main uh, advantage, one of the main advantages. Thank you, Gustavo. Uh, Gustavo, I have, um, I have also a question for you. I believe in the, in the late Adop adapter um, session, uh, you mentioned that the group B commented the the, the, the output of the group A yes. and uh, vice versa. Uh, why this choice? Why uh, why not a collective discussion with the defenders and the opposers, for instance? Or uh, yes, it, think, can you explain uh, better this? Yes. I think this uh, it was because uh, we expected more uh, participants. So the the com principal committee uh, think it was was best to divide the groups uh, into groups. So uh, to um, include uh, more uh, the people. Uh, allow more the people to participate yes so not not having a large group and instead of this uh, having a two groups separate and in the end uh, talking uh, between them yes but uh, probably in the not in this slide in the next one if i remember uh, can you go on please this no uh, yes this one you oh. you you mentioned commenting no participant yeah. in group a discuss the context and the scenario provided by group b 
So yes. they are separated also in the in the in the in the discussion. In the beginning, or they yes. are in the beginning, yes. So beginning. one group uh, analyzes the work of the other groups and uh, makes uh, some uh, some evaluation, no, some uh, some uh, some discussion about that. Yes. Yes. So without the without giving the the possibility to the to the group who produced that scenario to explain better to provide the additional ah, okay. arguments. Uh, the the platform uh, provides a, a a space to comment each proposals. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so when uh, when this uh, take place, the commenting part take place. Uh, the participants, uh, for example, the participants of group B uh, can read uh, which, what is, what, what is about the, the proposal. Yes. Okay. And uh, they, they, in this, in this moment, they like uh, or, or don't like the proposal. And uh, this group, the group B, uh, let a commenter, a commenting a comment about a the perspective about this this proposal. If is it can be implemented or not. Uh, if it is interesting or or not. If uh, is uh, not interesting. If yes, and uh, after that. Uh, group B uh, has the possibility possibility to reply. Yes. Ah, okay. Uh, they had the possibility to reply. This is uh, yes. okay. 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 Uh, very good, uh, Gustavo. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, sorry oh. by uh, by the English. <laughs> No, no it's very, we, we, it's very yeah. good. We understood everything. No problem about okay. that. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, Between Italian okay. English and Brazilian English uh, is easy to understand. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, we we have not. And we but say hello uh, also to Fabiana, which is uh, also from the group of Gustavo. Uh, you know, hello, okay. Fabiana. Ah, okay. Very good. Uh, but we have not the the second uh, the second paper. Uh, probably probably due to this uh, this uh, this not suitable time for the presentation. Uh, maybe. Okay, uh, Miguel, I believe that we have to close the session. Eh? Uh, we, we, as organizer, we we will try to, uh, to to provide you a feedback in some way and uh, to recall you for uh, other opportunities in uh, disseminating our results. So thank you for being here, especially for the Brazilians uh, attended, and uh, we hope to to meet you in a in a future occasion. Uh, in order to collaborate and to produce uh, good results as, this, as in this time. Okay. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michele. Have a, have a good day. A good conference. To Rafael, which is us, who is assisting us from the Faculty of Engineering. Okay, Rafael, thank you too. Could I remind you to fill the form for the evaluation of the paper? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank
Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Rafael, and uh, the room assistant for this session. Uh, we are waiting for Ochar to uh, join us, so please uh, yeah, be patient for a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, I think we can uh, start and uh, while we are waiting for uh, the chair to join. Uh, the first uh, presentation uh, is a um, comparable study of a pre trained model of Alzheimer's on Alzheimer's disease classification. Uh, in, uh, there is some uh, of the authors here. Yes, yes. Thank you. Can you share your screen and start your presentation? Okay, I'll do that. Okay, thank you very much. Share your screen. Um, oh God, I'm trying to share. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Is my screen visible? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good morning, the chair of this parallel session and uh, other member and other delegates that is in this parallel section. I'm here to present the paper ID 592 titled Comparative Study of Pre-trained Models on Alzheimer's Disease uh, Classification on behalf of the following authors. Yeah, the presentation outline goes thus. We have the introduction related works, methodology, results and discussion, conclusion and references. Now the introduction. Yeah, Ozoma disease is an irreversible progressive and neurogenerative disorder. According to Herbagama Nell Itahol 2020, and it gradually destroys memory and also induces some uh, complications in uh, communication and uh, all the uh, uh, everyday work in the likes of speaking and um, working also. And from studies, there is an estimate of uh, 131 million people projected to be living with Alzheimer's disease by the year 2020 from study from childhood to 2020. And the progression of this disease uh heaps up to a widespread of um a widespread of um, mental loss in the likes of a uh, memory defect language impairment personality change and also disorientation which eventually leads to death and we have the intermediate uh stages often referred to as a mild cognitive uh, impairment if not uh, detected in time, will eventually lead to death. So the progression of this disease, oftentimes, if not well uh, managed, will eventually lead to death. Was it aggravated to Alzheimer's disease? And a popular uh, uh, a popular approach uh, that is long established in the in the diagnosis of uh, Alzheimer's disease is the neuroimaging techniques which is uh, often uh, non-invasive and also uh, had been able 
to to sufficiently get information for the detect for, for for identifying um brain uh, abnormalities and these neuroimaging techniques are uh, we have the um the, the, the magnetic resonance imaging, which could be structural or functional. We have the person emission uh, tomography. We have uh, the, the, the computerized uh, tomography and so on. So in recent years, several studies based on deep learning are focused on the analysis of uh, magnetic resonance imaging data for early detection of uh, Alzheimer disease. So, and therefore, the aim of this paper is to present a comparative analysis of the effectiveness and sensitivity of different um, pre-trained models to classify Ozoma disease uh, from magnetic uh, resonance uh, imaging uh, data. So, here are some of the selected uh, related works that hit uh, the, the study. Fulago Ito 2020 utilized and head to head uh, deep learning uh, co co convolution neural network. And uh, from their study, they were able to compare the, the performance of four pre trained models for Ozoma disease biomarker identification in multi class classification. And the limitation of the was that brain regions involved in the dissection making were not analyzed. The Digital 2019. 19 also utilize uh, inception a v3 uh, convolution neural network in which they provide they were able to the, the study was able to provide the distinct features for heli mild cognitive impairment and normal cognitive and uh, the limitation of the work is that the robustness of the model was not uh, guaranteed also masoko it hall 2019 uh, Propose an efficient transfer learning architecture based on pre trainers less net for utilize uh, for early uh, diagnosis of uh, Alzheimer disease, in which they were able to provide deep features for Alzheimer disease detection. These deep features were extracted from there, were able to get the deep features. Also, the limitation is that the accuracy of the model by fine tuning all layers was not uh, analyzed. It only dealt with the facial extraction and the fine tuning, uh, which has to do with the transfer learning, was not really uh, analyzed. Also, Yagito 2019 also utilized the layer wise transfer learning or CNN architecture in the diagnosis of Arizona, uh, disease, in which they were able to investigate the performance of three pre trained models on magnetic resonance the imaging uh, data the basic limitation of the what was that the sample use was a uh, very very small based on this limitation and the underlying background here is our proposed uh, methodology for this uh, study which we have the uh, input data which has to be with the magnetic uh, resonance uh, uh, imaging data then we have the um, uh, pre-trained model which has to have get the, the, the descriptive features for the disease, then the classification, and uh, which has to be with the normal dematia, dematia, and my dematia. Dematia is just like a general term uh, for, for impaired um, uh, ability in which Alzheimer's disease could be used also to uh, get guarantee you know, if you have dematia or you don't have or you have a my dematia. So we also move on to the performance evaluation after training and so on. We get the performance evaluation based on some metrics and um, do the model testing and uh, the, the best model because we are analyzing we are looking at we are investigating the performance of a uh, different uh, pre-trained models on the uh, uh, Alzheimer disease uh, detection for early Alzheimer disease uh, detection so this is a workflow of the study and also for this study the data set uh, that was utilized is the open uh, access study uh, imaging series data set and this data set consists of t1 weighted magnetic resonance imaging of subjects with uh, Alzheimer disease obtained from all the adults between the age of 60 to uh, 90 years there's a sample of the slices of the magnetic uh, resonance imaging is depicted in figure uh, two 
And uh, this is a description of the pre-CNN models. In this study, we uh, look, we were able to, to examine uh, six uh, pre-trained models based on from the literature review. I think they, for the, on God, they were able to investigate just for, so we had been able to investigate about um, six pre-trained models, and this is the reshape layer for feature extraction. We look at feature extraction also, we look at uh, fine tuning also, that this is a composition of the reshape layer based on the uh, output, uh, which it has to do with the number of classes that we are trying to uh, classify. So based on the uh, experiment, this is the result. Uh, of uh, of from uh, uh, results and discussion from our experiment, we look at binary classification for the pre-trained models that they were able to 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 classify based on two classes. We also look at the multi-class classification as well. So this is for the binary classification from the six uh, pre-trained model. We have the validation accuracy. And the training accuracy, in which we have, uh, uh, in which uh, we, we we have um, squeeze nets performing much more better based on this uh, um, uh, accuracy. Based on this metric, which has to do with uh, accuracy, so we have this net performing much more better for binary uh, classification. So we also look at the multi-class classification also. So the performance based on multi-class classification is not as uh, good as we have in the uh, binary classification. And this is owing to the fact that when we look at the uh, intermediate stages of the mild cognitive uh, impairment, which has to do with the early uh, the onset of Alzheimer's disease, the between those intermediate changes, the brain, the brain changes, there is they are very similar. So it's not so easy to be able to delete the difference between those uh, uh, um, uh, stages, and I think this is what is happening in this case. So we have uh, the between those stages, which has to be the intermediate stage, not so, it's so close. At so excuse me, you're early. Early. Thank you. So we now have a uh, use graph that this is this graph show us the between the uh, performers of the pre-trained model on both binary and the multi-class uh, classification. So we can see based on what I've discussed, the binary is actually, they perform much more better on the binary classification. And this is um, the per class classification performance for uh, sensitivity also. We've seen that, okay, they also perform much more better on the the multi multi-class, they, they were able to donate the 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 uh, non-demetria, which has to be were able to classify it, uh, classify it. Look, they were able to the model were able to discriminate the the non-demetria much more better than other uh, classes. So, and based on the study, we were able to bring out this conclusion that early detection of Ozoma disease remains a challenge and deep learning classification as a tree researcher due to its flexibility and ability to um, generate optimal findings. And this study utilized transfer learning approach using various CNN models, which include DESNET, JTRSNET 18, and so on. So the models had been well-trained for our OASIS data set and they were all effective at classification in which SqueezeNet gave the best uh, accuracy. So in future, two or more pre-trained models could be hybridized to enhance the classification accuracy of multi-class classification by analyzing the brain regions involved in decision making. Here are my selected references for this uh, study and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, there is any question for uh, this presentation? Okay, I think uh, there is no question. So we can go on with a second presentation. Uh, evaluation of indoor localization and earth rate evaluation. Uh, is any of the author present? Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Arthur. I'm the co-author of the paper. I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Um, is it okay? Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So, so then I'm just going to start. Thank you so much for having me. Um, basically, this um, uh, this this paper presents part of the research that was carried out in a project in a European research project called iLight. And basically, what we try to do is we try to do a comparative evaluation of um, of some devices that can be used for indoor localization, and we try to combine this with capturing of physiological parameters. So in this case, we, we try to capture uh, the evolution of heart rate, okay? And so the presentation, we start with a bit of motivation and the system architecture, just to put everything into context. And then I'm going to, to go over the experimental evaluation that we did. And if, if I have time, I'll just gloss over the state of the art and then, then just move, move on to, to the discussion and to conclusions. So basically what stands behind this entire research is a phenomenon called population aging, which at least in, in Europe and I think in North America too, is something that is very well known. So basically one example here, it shows you, you know, that the number of adults over 60 is expected to increase greatly. And one of the challenges is that we know that people have longer and longer lifespans, but the, the real challenge right now is to make sure that not only do people live longer, but that they live healthy and fulfilled lives, right? Even in old age. And one of the ways that, that, um, that uh, I don't know, companies, authorities, national organizations try to encourage this is by involving technology, involving ICT, right? So for instance, we have this example of uh, the European Union, which started the active and assisted uh, living program right in, in 2016, which basically um, encourages organizations to develop um, ICT based solutions for for active and, and assisted living, either for people who are, who are older or for people who have all kinds of um, of cognitive or physical impairments, right? So the kind of impairments that, that the previous authors discussed about, right, it's, it's, it would be very, very befitting for such a system. Okay, and basically what we try to do in this research project on the whole is we try to develop an integrative cyber physical platform. So basically this is, this is uh, a system which, um, which consists of some, some hardware sensors and hardware nodes which communicate with, with the software server and the software server does all kinds of intelligent things, you know, monitor behavior, uh, raise a real time alert if, uh, if the system uh, detects a risk or, or, or some, some healthcare issue of the user and so on. And this paper basically wants to, wants to discuss two, two things here. Um, first of all, we want to, to report on, on, on our evaluation regarding the accuracy of indoor localization, when very importantly, we want to use commercially available hardware devices because they are cheaper, they, they are easy to set up, and they also don't look out of place, right? So if you want to monitor an enclosure or an older relative's house, you can set up the system and you know it, it doesn't look out of place. And the second part is, of course, we also want to compare um, uh, using the, these commercial systems we, with something that, uh, that we previously developed a more complex, but, but a less affordable solution, right? A custom developed um, lightning bulb, and, I'll show, show it in a, in a couple of slides, right? Uh, so again, just as a quick recap with regards to system architecture. So basically the system is a, is a bunch of smart connected devices. So basically connection is, you have to imagine Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, and they are of course connected to, to software, right? And at the highest level, basically the software is able to provide um, AI based analysis notifications, and so on. Very importantly, the system has to provide some real-time alerting capabilities, right? Because it has to be able to, to notify someone in case, you know, a risk has appeared, okay? So a risk could be, for instance, a high concentration of volatile gases, um, a too high or too low temperature, you know, um, bad air quality or, or anything of the sort, right? Or, or gas or electricity monitoring or something like that. Okay, very, uh, at a very high level, the system architecture would be something like this. So at the lowest level, you have the devices. So either medical devices or home automation devices. These home automation devices are the kind of devices that we're, we're looking into right now. At a bit of a higher level, you are already have the software services. You have the gateway, the monitoring uh, uh, services and home management services. 
And then you have the expert level system at the highest level, right? With system management and with data analysis. So the gist of uh, today's paper is we try to we try to use two different types of home automation devices and check whether the system is able to maintain, you know, room level uh, indoor localization with both of them. And we also try to integrate them with uh, some sort of assistive device, which which is able to which is able to to measure the number of steps taken by the user and their heart rate. Okay, and again, the big the big advantage here, of course, is the fact that uh, that these devices are commercially available. So if you want to, if you want to add them to the system, you can just go out and buy them, and they have all the certifications and so on. Uh, now, in order to add a new device into the system, basically, we need to, to, to create a human readable configuration file and we need to distribute it over the software services. So the idea here, of course, is that you don't need to, to bake in other kinds of software in order to, to add a new device, right? You just need to have a configuration file which is able to expose the interfaces and it's able to expose the capabilities, right? So that the system knows how and what to query from the device and you need to, to upload it into the existing system. And then of course, uh, the new device should be, should be ready to use. So with regards to our experimental evaluation, so we already have a previous work where we developed uh, a number of custom devices and we've shown that we can actually do room level indoor localization using them. Basically what room level indoor localization means is that the system is able to tell in which room of the house the, the monitor person is currently in. And this could be interesting, for instance, if, uh, if the monitor person, for instance, uh, goes out of the monitored enclosure, um, or they spend too little or too much time somewhere, or their behavior suddenly changes, then the system is able to figure out that something might not be okay. And then the system could either query the user, is everything okay, yes, no, or it could send an alert to, to a formal or to an informal caregiver, like, like a family member telling them that, uh, listen, something might be wrong, so maybe check up on, check up on your relative, right? <laughs> And uh, to be able to actually deploy and use this system, it's very important that these systems are actually uh, cost effective, that they're cheap. Right? And that's why we try to evaluate the feasibility of uh, replacing, you know, some hardware devices that were custom developed with something that's more cost efficient than something that is off the shelf. Okay, the second thing that we also try, try to look into is in order to get more data, well, how can we integrate some existing devices into the system? Because we know that in many cases, these research projects, you know, they, they develop a bunch of devices, the research project ends, and then kind of the devices don't move on to commercialization phase, they just, um, they, they just sit in limbo, right? So that's why we, we take a device such as the Fitbit Versa 2, which basically you, you can find it everywhere, and, and it's, it's a very nice, uh, but very, I don't know, a regular smartwatch which can, which can measure steps and which can measure heart rate. And we show that we, we are able to, to successfully integrate it into the platform and gather data from, from it. Now, just uh, very quickly, here you have two photos. So on the left-hand side, this one, the left-hand side photo shows the custom developed device. Now here, of course, we also have a bunch of sensors included, right? So it can measure also temperature, humidity, and uh, volatile compound levels, so, so harmful gas levels. While on the right-hand side, it's basically a Philips Hue bulb. So it's a, it's a smart bulb, but one that is widely available commercially. You can just go out and buy it, right? And it has a Bluetooth connection. Um, and you can basically set, I think, the color and the intensity of the of indoor lighting using it. Okay. Excuse me, you have uh, two minutes left. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So basically what we tried to do is we tried to, to, to deploy the system in an apartment. Uh, it's very important to figure out what kind of, uh, what kind of walls and what kind of, um, what kind of furniture the apartment has. And then we try to use direct trilateration, right? So we use the received signal uh, strength from from the smart light bulbs to figure out uh, to figure out the localization of um, of the monitored person, right? So this is a formula that that is kind of well known. It was developed, sorry, in 2019, and 
and using it we are able to tell the distance between one light bulb and and the user and to try to do the trial iteration we use the levenberg markart algorithm right which uses gradient descent so here's basically the floor plan and here's basically the user's path and with the yellow you have highlighted right the free the free luminaires that were deployed Okay. So very quickly then, this is the mean localization error. We have the two graphs. One of them is for the Philips Hue light bulb and one of them is for the custom developed light bulb. And you can see that the errors are very close. And both of them basically allow us to do indoor, indoor localization at the room level. So we are able to figure out in which room the user is currently in. And here you can also see that we are able to figure out right which uh, uh, the heart rate of the user and corroborate the user's heart rate with, with their localization, right? Okay, so yeah, I'm just going to skip over the state of the art then. And um, just just say that this is what what we try to achieve. And this next step, we probably want to integrate some some new devices and probably do a piloting deployment somewhere. But uh, obviously, due to due to to the COVID scenarios, this is this is a bit too difficult, right? Because there are still all kinds of restrictions and um, and issues, you know, with with doing these sorts of things. Okay, so thank you, then. And uh, if you have any questions, thank you for your presentation. Uh, any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we can go on with the. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. With the third presentation, uh, exercise abnormality detection using uh, blaze pose skeleton reconstruction. Yeah. We can see your screen. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so I can start? Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so my name is Older Skulikaivas, and the name of our research is Exercise Abnormality Detection Using Placeable Skeleton Reconstruction. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the main problem that our research attempts to resolve is the identification and evaluation of improper posture during the exercise. While there are already existing uh, state-of-the-art approaches that try to solve similar problems, they generally have various downsides, such as they focus only on the classification of the posture, which leaves out uh, the evaluation of deviation uh, or they depend on specialized sensors, for example, depth sensors. So with this research, we aim to propose and implement a computerized deep machine learning model uh, for the detection and deviation of deviation evaluation of the exercise abnormalities by using the placebo skeleton uh, reconstruction backbone. So there are quite a few practical applications, uh, starting with physicians being able to monitor the health of a patient to check if their condition is improving or deteriorating. Uh, there's also links between body posture uh, and mental fatigue and stress. This would allow us to track that. And improper posture can even be linked to uh, other health conditions such as cardiovascular disease or even early mortality, this may be uh, possible to reduce the risk of that. So the main novelty in our paper is that we propose a method which is capable of real-time post-abnormality detection in addition to calculating the deviation from the correct uh, exercise pose without the need for specialized sensors. So if we compare this approach to other existing approaches, we can see that other approaches generally rely on specialized sensors and cannot work with monocular cameras. They are not, uh, some of them are not occlusion resistant, uh, are not able to uh, detect abnormalities in the performed uh, both or even quantize the error. So as previously mentioned, we use blaze post skeleton detection uh, in order to extract the 33 joints 
perform the body. However, we are not stable, so we apply a Gaussian uh, kernel to reduce the noise. So the blaze pose provides 33 uh, skeleton joints. However, they are missing some of the key features, for example, spine. So we reduce the skeleton to only the uh, necessary uh, joints. So to evaluate, evaluate the deviation, we use uh, three main heuristics. This is spinal, uh, head, and shoulder deviations. We, we calculate them based on uh, some joint conditions. So as we can see, uh, the spinal heuristic is the primary one that helps us to evaluate if the uh, exercise was performed co correctly or incorrectly, as there's a clear uh, uh, dividing line between those two uh, poses. Uh, meanwhile, head heuristic is not as great of an uh, indicator of uh, correctly or incorrectly performed pose. However, it is still very important in order to calculate the deviation. Similarly, uh, the shoulder heuristic is a more pronounced uh, difference between healthy and healthy, unhealthy, uh, properly and improperly uh, performed pose. Uh, however, it is also important in measuring uh, correctness. So, so because we use blaze pose skeleton uh, reconstruction backbone, we are able to achieve uh, 23 millisecond response times, which is on, on the CPU, which is more than enough for real time performance. And to conclude, uh, in the research, we proposed and implemented a deep heuristic computerized model, which is capable of not only classifying the uh, correct and incorrect poses, but also estimating the deviation from the nominal exercise parameters. Uh, the exercise experiments have shown that the biggest indicator of the posture abnormalities is in fact the spinal deviation, which accounted for 95 of all uh, posture related abnormalities and the application of blaze pose backbone has allowed us to achieve uh, 23 millisecond response times, which is more than enough for real time prediction. Uh, and that is all. Thank you for your presentation. There is any questions? Okay, thank you. I think uh, we can start with the last presentation. Uh, an excellent approach of the adaptation of the brain tumor using uh, fuzzy log logic. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but, uh, let me uh, share my screen uh, with you. Thank you. Uh, can you share my? Can you see my screen? See? Yes, you can see your screen. Okay, sure. Uh, the topic uh, of my presentation is an effective approach for the detection of brain tumor using fuzzy logic and unit CNN classifications. So the presentation summary, we will firstly cover the problem statement and objectives and the proposed methodology and experimental results and discussion and finally the conclusion. So what's really problem we are facing uh, is the conventional approaches using labeling methods to detect the abnormal pixel in the areas of the brain. And the previous approaches uh, fail to detect the inside of the edge pixel, which is not appropriate for the different brain tumor detection system. To overcome these problems, uh, the objective uh, we have proposed uh, in this work is the contrast enhancement method is used as a pre-processing step to increase the edges detail from the source images. Afterwards, uh, the dual tree complex wavelet transform is used to uh, the images at different scale level. And the fuzzy logic based feature extraction method is used to find the edges in the brain tumor MR images. And finally, the unit CNN classification method is used for the detection and the classification of the tumor imaging both myon geoma and non myon geoma. Uh, so, this is the proposed method. Uh, the figure one shows the proposed method. Uh, the concept of the tumor segmentation classification uh, consists of the contrast enhancement for the logic based feature extraction method and the classification. So, we will discuss each and every step uh, in the presentation. So firstly, uh, the, in the contrast enhancement method uh, is used to identify the low contrast images. The histogram equalization approach seems to be the more effective method. 
uh, in this regards, uh, non-prematic modified histogram equalization is used to increase the contrast and keep the average brightness of the source images. Uh, the uh, the NPMHA removed the spike from the original histogram. After that, the process clipped the histogram and compute the CDF of the uh, transitional rehabilitated histogram from the unified one. So after that, it's worked as a weighted factor to create the updated histogram. Now you can see that uh, the figure A is the source image and after applying the contrast enhanced image, uh, the figure B, uh, there is a prominent improvement in the source images. Okay. After what the due to complex wavelet transform uh, is used as a traditional decomposition technique for acquiring the subband images or at numerous scale. Uh, the, uh, actually, the dual tree complex wavelet transform is intended with the complex wavelet and complex scaling functions. So, uh, afterwards, the fuzzy logic based edge detection method is presented to acquire the edges map from the contrast enhanced images. Uh, I have created the three cross three convolution marks uh, using the 16 pattern to obtain the grayscale neighborhood pixel value in the contrast enhanced image. Uh, the grayscale neighborhood pixel value required from the mark are the process you before the fuzzy interference system. Uh, the system is created to see the process value as the input, then convert these values to the fuzzy plane. A library of a fuzzy rule has been determined and display the edges pixel of the output images. Uh, the output system is computed using the centroid technique and defuzzification uh, according to uh, Mandani interference. And you can see that in figure three, this is the symmetric diagram. So how the edge detection method is used using the fuzzy logic method. And figure four shows the 16 pattern detection of the edge detection. So after uh, you can see that the figure A is the source images and the B is the gradients of figure A by applying the fuzzy logic based feature extraction. And C is the contrast enhanced method. And after applying the fuzzy, uh, logic based feature extraction method on contrast enhanced method, there's a prominent improvement and the detection of the tumor as compared to figure B. So, uh, the afterward, the final step is the unit CNN is used for the brain tumor imaging detection and declassification. The proposed unit CNN operates the perception of a zero padding for both the up and the down sampling to enhance the response of each layer that is not existing in the usual unit framework. So this is the figure six show the architecture of the unit CNN. Uh, so these are the results which have, uh, we have obtained that uh, the figure eight uh, it is the source image and figure B, uh, eight B is the tumor segmented image. And finally the tumor is extracted uh, from the source image. Uh, the simulation setup is, uh, is performed on a MATLAB on a laptop and the experiment are evaluated on Mion Joma brain MR images and the data set contain uh, about uh, a total of 708 brain MR images but this work contain a total of 571 Mion Joma brain uh, MR images to assess the performing of the proposed method. The tumor detection and the segmentation technique is employed on these images. So the qualitative uh, evaluation uh, the, we have achieved an accuracy of the 98.45, sensitivity of 98.04, specificity of 98.86, and dice coefficient index of 96.95, and the classification accuracy of 98.59. And we have also compared our result with several state of the arts method in order to check the qualitative assessment of our method. So the proposed method outperform all the previous methods uh, by using the unit CNN classification. Uh, this finally the conclusion, uh, this paper proposed a brain tumor segmentation method using fuzzy edge detection and unit CNN classification. Uh, firstly, the contrast stretching uh, as a pre-processing step is used to find the edge detail in an image. Then a full level distinct time coblet, uh, sorry, distinct field coblet wave transform is used to decompose these MR enhanced images into subband images. Then the uh, for the logic based edge detection method is used to find the edges detail on the MR brain images. Finally, the proposed brain tumor detection method is evaluated by applying the proposed unit CNN framework. Uh, the simulation result proved that the proposed approach achieved better performing in terms of both visually and enriched information extraction when compared with the other state of the art algorithm. 
and he proposed a classification method and attain an accuracy of 98.59. So this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think we have uh, some uh, questions uh, from the chat. Uh, Professor uh, Andrew uh, Lovrezon, if you want to turn on your microphone, you can uh, make your question. If you prefer, I can read that. Uh, it this features? Yeah, uh, okay, I read the, uh, okay. I read your, uh, the questions that uh, Professor Lorizon wrote in the chat. Uh, was this data eti uh, ethically collected? And uh, why did you not apply uh, Pareto optimization to DTW? Those are the questions. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, pick up your question properly. Uh, if, uh, if you don't mind, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, okay, the first question is, uh, was this data ethically collected? Uh, data? Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I haven't used uh, my data set because the data set uh, is uh, attained from the specific source. So I haven't created any data set from my, from my site. It's a, it's a brain MR images uh, data set is already uh, presented both of benign and malignant from the uh, source. So I haven't uh, take any data set from my set. Okay. And the second question is, uh, why did you not apply uh, power optimization to DTW? Uh, well, uh, I have also uh, given these things in my uh, paper that these things will further be analyzed uh, for the uh, in the next uh, in the future work. So uh, which I, will, I will really focus on, but in my future work, I have uh, mentioned this point uh, in the paper as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, there is uh, any other questions? Okay, then I think we can close this uh, this panel. Thank you all for attending this session. Uh, I hope uh, we can see you to the next uh, year, year to X. Thank you all.
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If somebody need to test the presentation, I think that Rafael uh, could help him to, to test. If, if it is possible, I would like to try okay. to share uh, my screen. To, to share the screen. Rafael, you can. Good morning. Yeah, uh, I am share my screen then.
Okay, I think it's work. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. I'm the third, Welcome. the third presenter. Okay, Stefano, we want to try? Yeah. Um, Okay. okay, it seems well. Perfect. I'm the last presenter. Yeah. Jessica, do you like to uh, test, try to share your screen? Oh, good morning. Just a second. Okay. Okay. Try to. Okay. To share uh, next slide, just to to see if it works. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then there's Mauro. I know if there is Mauro. No, not yet. Jessica, you, you are the first. Yeah. And we are waiting for the second one. It's Mauro. Let's see. Okay. Azura is in. Stefano. Stefano. I'm here. I don't see you. You can see me. No, I cannot. Hmm. Now? No, yeah. Good. Perfect. So we lose just one presenter. Not so bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> one. Okay, we are in time. 
I think we, we can give you uh, 12 minutes and three minutes for the discussion, question, and so on. Okay. My, my role is to remember you this time is going on. Sorry, so, my internet stopped for a minute. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. So, good morning, everyone. I'm Jessica Santu. I'm a student of Police University of Sao Paulo. And today I'm going to introduce a little bit about the work Home Automation for People with Autism Spectrum Disorder. So, first, let's define what autism is. Autism is considered a biological disorder that alters the brain's ability to understand sensory stimuli which are perceptions of smells, textures, sounds, lights, colors, and everything the human body is capable of feeling, making them sensitive to these sensations. There is a lot of other difficulties, but today in this work, we will focus on sensory difficulties, okay? So, considering the technology has been an ally in different areas, an intelligent, safe, and cozy environment was thought consistent of a cell phone or, or a computer application aiming to help in nervous crisis occurring in autistic people and help in their daily activities and promote the saving of research without reducing the comfort. So it's known that other systems that could help just like this one, but here we can look at the socioeconomic graphic and understand the economic level in which most people live. So imagine the situation. Family in class C1 receive approximately 1,300 pounds. The family 2 C2 receive 900 pounds. And the family D receives 600 pounds. And they did spend the whole month with this amount. Here in Brazil, the price of an Alexa with a screen, for example, cost approximately 1,800 pounds, which is higher than a salary of class C1. So some exist equipments for disabled in general. They are marketed with the high values for mud of population, which ends up making the cost and consequently the serum more expensive. Here, the idea of RCE is that should be accessible to all classes because this should go beyond the commerce and profit. It should be a social project in search of improvement the coexistence and experience with people who have this difficult. Here, we have the evolution of numbers of diagnoses over the year. And according to the World Health Organization, there are approximately 70 million people in the world who have autism spectrum disorder. And studies present the family with a higher family income usually receive the diagnosis of their child early than family with the lower person power. These people have better condition to treat their children because the sooner the diagnosis is made, the early the treatments begin and the chance to control and the very understanding of how it works, it's better. So the existence of family who need help in their routines for having a dependent person is justified as being a complex experience full of difficulties and extreme responsibilities, since the autist person may be personally or totally dependent on their parents. So this work aims to create and develop tools that help to control and reduce crises that occur in autistic people, taught a medical protocol as family configure the necessary actions for a better well-being for autistic people, enabling them to have a qualified of life and to live the best condition in relation to their disease and the way it affected their body and mind. So the work consists of a set of automations and softwares that communicate with each other, becoming a system that automates analogs aspect of the residence according to the user's need, manually or thought analysis of the level of stress presented, aiming to assist in crisis control and treatment of disabled people with autism spectrum disorder. The measurement of stress level will be given by the sum of two factors, muscle tension and the heart rate. The human body is present a series of tension points called the trigger points. However, the most common point related to stress is the tension in trapezius, a muscle location in the neck. So the sensor is responsible for picking up the electrical sign the muscle generate when it's contract, capture this small sign and amplify in order of microvolts. Regarding the alterations of heartbeat, 
One of the most common causes for people who don't have a heart disease is this to stress situation. So the sensor will work together. And if any time only one of these two sensor identify a level that it's outside a configurate, the system will check the second sensor to see if there is any change. The sum of these two factors when above the normal will automatically trigger the system, which will have the function of identifying the best way to help the cries to the cries or not happen at all. The system have three help options, the treatments, the security and control. First, let's talk about the security. We have three options, door lock, window lock, and emergency message. The system will be connected to the doors and windows that will have the lock activity when the system identifies a high level of stress. Being also possible, it's configured according to the user's preferences. About the emergency message, the system will also trigger alert message warning the reducer emergency contact that autist person has a high stress level and it's possible in a crisis. About the control, we have two options, luminosity and sonority. About the luminosity, the user can set the appropriate brightness level to make the autist comfortable, or he can leave the system in automatic mode. Adjudging the brightness as soon as detected a brightness accept above to acceptable setting. And about the sonority, the system will also activate the anti-noise window when it's detected a sound above the acceptable setting, also uh, allowing the manual activation of this option. Now about the treatments, the system have two options, chromotherapy and music therapy. The chromotherapy is a science that use colors to restore, balance and harmonize to the body, mind and emotions. We understand that each color has a specific vibration and ter therapeutic capacity. The chromotherapy was recognized as a complementary therapy to traditional medicine by the World Health Organization in 1976. The music therapy is either a science, and the technique aims to communicate and encourage the relationship, motivation, and learning of patients by studying their reactions to the sound music stimuli. The therapy value is found in the capacity the music has to produce uh, effects on human being, on biological, physiological, psychological, intellectual, and social levels. So mm -hmm. the system have these two options, which can be configured according to the user's preferences or following the system suggestions. In the case of the chromotherapy, will be based on the theory of colors, and in the case of the music therapy, will be based on theory of four elements. You guys can read more about this in the article. Uh, about the results and discussions, from the case study was observed a sensitive improvement in moments of crisis, contributing to the control of anxiety and stress. Considering that this was a single case study, it was demonstrated that if this case study were extended to other people, it would become even broader and more eff effectivity. An interview realized with the patients and their family was predicted that the system would be beneficial in their daily control of heartbeat, muscle tension, and stress level itself. The treatments used in the system are used in treatment clinics. So imagine the autist person does these treatments only two or three times a week within the clinic, and it's beneficial for him. So now imagine the autist person can do these treatments every day, anytime, ready to take an action if necessary. The treatments would become continuous, being also possible to minimize the gravity of crisis. So the system can provide a stark record that can be reported to the doctor with the date, time and duration of a crisis. Uh, with each and passing days, the use of the technology and artificial intelligence is growing and consolidates itself in the social sphere. Actions then in the past were considered um, unmanageable are now part of our lives. And it's with this thought of involving people knowledge and care, along with the desire that this subject does not stop here, this work was developed. The study of the topic revealed to be humble and with the potential for improvement even the project that was presented in this article, providing future studies and analysis. So for new studies, we will explore methods of detecting which of human senses unleashes a crisis and which treatments was applied to reduce it. The RCE system has the intention of not only change the way of life of autistic people, but that it's possible to change the technology called the brain that exists inside of each one. Only then we have a better society able to respect everyone, always living in harmony. Thank you, everyone. Oh.
Uh, okay, uh, Jessica, you are so quick, <laughs> and you you don't use all the time you have. Uh, so, if there is some question about your the interesting presentation of Jessica, uh, of course the floor is free for questions. And some curiosity about this. Uh, innovative system to manage a problem uh, so uh, important like uh, autism disorder. Uh, I, I think it's, it's very interesting your approach to manage this situation. And even if it's only a case study, uh, in my opinion, it's important to uh, explore and, and try to, in different cases, uh, this uh, this approach, this system, and where the technology can really uh, be useful uh, uh, to to give a better uh, better life to these people. Yeah. Uh, so many thanks for this. Uh, presentation for your presentation. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. Uh, I don't know if there is Mauro or Matsei, but I didn't see in the room. So I, I, I think we can uh, uh, pass the, the floor uh, to Azura. Yes. And give the floor to Azura uh, if Mauro, uh, Matei, or other colleagues uh, connect, uh, maybe uh, in a second moment uh, okay. they can present the presentation after. So, Azura, uh, can you share your screen and present uh, your, your paper about the smart mobility? Please. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I would like to thank you to attend this session and I would like to thank the co-authors that are belonging to the University of Cassino and Southern Lazio as the professors Mauro D'Apuzzo, Stefano Buzzi, Daniela Santilli and Viviana Bitoni, but also uh, the belonging to the Italian National Research Council as the engineer Mauro Mazzei. I'm Azzurra Evangelisti, a researcher at the University of Cassino in Southern Lazio, and I will present a work uh, titled New Smart Mobility Applications, uh, Preliminary Findings on a Pilot Study in the Municipality of Artena. This uh, presentation is composed of a brief introduction to the smart mobility concept, then an in-depth overview of the municipality of uh, Artena will be really performed, then the traffic model of the city and the preliminary flow evaluations will be presented and finally uh, the conclusion will be deduced. First of all, it is important to try to define the smart mobility concept, which is always related to the smart, the smart city concept. So first of all, the smart mobility as a traditional mobility has to guarantee the accessibility but must be also sustainable, innovative and safe, and it can use advanced information and communic communication technologies. So the main aims are the reduction of the congestion, for example, through the uh, promotion of sharing services, but also the reduction of the pollution through the incentivization of public transportation, uh, electric vehicles and active modes for moving, but also be a support providing real-time mobility information or providing uh, payment services. There is a rich framework of international regulation to define and promote the smart mobility activities as the 5G uh, for Europe plan, the mobility for Europe or the sustainable and smart mobility strategy. 
Some of them have been accepted and adapted to the Italian context by means of the Smart Road Decree, which promotes the design and the development of an advanced digital platform, and by means of the Smarter Program, Smarter Italy Program, which finances the 5G experimentation and the development of traffic monitoring techniques uh, with innovative and advanced sensor. The SUMA project, the Smart Human Mobility Management project, can be considered a response to this uh, national call where the municipality of Artena, which, uh, with qualified uh, partners as the University of Cassino, the Telecom Italia and the National Inter-University Consortium for the Telecommunication, is financing the development of a digital platform for the smart mobility on its territories. Uh, this platform, by means of innovative sensor, has high definition cameras or drones, allowed the calibration and the validation of a system for the uh, recognition, the vehicle classification, but also the recognition of cyclists and pedestrians for the tracking trip, trip trajectories and the speed estimation. Uh, this information are needed for the evaluation of the origin destination matrix and speeds. The first is used for smart parking and coupled with the speed with the knowledge of the speed can be used for the estimation and the environmental control system, but also for the safety aspects and sharing activities. So in order to design a smart mobility system and the platform, the development of the travel demand forecasting model of the territory is required. It is an ordered system of four submodels, each top of them related to one or more choice dimensions, as the traffic emission model, the traffic distribution model, the traffic mode choice model, and the path choice model. It provides on a specific reference period all the trips that occurred in a specific analysis area. And according to their purpose, time period, origin, destination, path, transport mode, and socioeconomic role of the users. So to develop this model on Artena, an in-depth investigation on the territories, the economic activities, and the actual traffic has to be performed. So Artena is an Italian municipality of the metropolitan city of Rome, about 30 kilometers south. It is basically composed of an ancient part at altitude between 460 meters above the level sea, and it is close to the traffic vehicle, and composed of a resident part accessible to the vehicles between 200 and 250 meters. Here is represented the distribution of the inhabitants, and here are summarized the number for describing the population and the economic units on the territory. Artena benefits from the presence of several infrastructure outside the municipal area, but which strongly affect internal traffic. In fact, there are two railway lines, the Rome Casino and the Rome Velletri, with three closed stops. The A1 Rome Naples Highway with Valmontone and Colleferro exits. But there are also two important roads the Regional Road 6 Caselina and the State Road 7 Appia. In the municipality area, there are four main regional roads. The care that allows the internal penetration of Artena and that compose the main road network and the dense secondary uh, road network, which complete the uh, Artena's road network system. In order to identify an effective zoning 
and a preliminary evaluation of the traffic flow due to both work and study purpose can be performed by using an open source database of the Italian National Institute of Statistics, ISTAT. And the results can be used for the definition of a preliminary origin destination metric, which is usually composed of four three trips category. First of all, the internal trips that are all trips that start and finish in the municipality of Artena, which are emitted and attracted. Exchange trips internal, external, that are old trips that start from Artena and finish outside the municipal area. The exchange trip external, internal, that on the contrary, are all the trips that start outside Artena and finish inside the municipal area. And finally, the crossing trip, that are all the trips that have both Origin and destination external to the municipality area, but use the transportation system of Artena affecting the internal traffic. In this last case, the municipalities adjacent to the territory of Artena have been selected for the study, and all the relevant attractor within a radius of 50 kilometer area, including Rome, Frosinone, and Latina. For the zoning phase, starting from 38 micro zone of Artena, embedding on the previous consideration, consideration, 11 internal zones have been identified with the related centroid and seven internal centroid on the seven con interconnection on the boundary of the area have been located. This selection guarantees the presence of more than 99% of population, more than 90% of economical activities, and more than 95% of total trees. So, basing on this zoning, the graph of the municipality of Artena has been developed. Without traffic counts, in order to develop a traffic daily pattern, it has been assumed that the morning peak hour metric is the area between the four exit time interval of the Istat community matrix. The lunch hour metric is composed of 100% of trips for study purpose and half percent of work trips uh, of public. In process. Then the afternoon hour metric is composed of 50% of work trips for public employees and 100% of uh, trips of uh, private workers. Finally, the off peak hour metrics uh, have been fixed as a fraction of 0, 0.05 of the morning peak hour. And finally, to take into account the presence of any vehicles and other trips purpose, the metrics have been um, amplified. Here, the results, the preliminary results, in fact, we can see the traffic flow distribution, for example, for morning and afternoon hours, obtained from the ESTAT open source database. The model has been uh, calibrated has to be calibrated and validated with traffic counts, but we can already deduce that the internal penetration roads of Artena are the basal links of the municipality due to the prominent crossing and exchange traffic respect to the internal trip. If these results will be confirmed by the traffic counts, Market project could be designed to guarantee traffic fluidification by means of smart tools, as for example, variable message panel or smart traffic lights. So, 
To conclude, here the SUMA project promoted by the Smarter Italy project has been presented. In particular, the pilot project took place into Artena municipality and involved the design and development of a digital platform system for the advanced mobility analysis. The traffic model that is the foundation of this digital platform uh, has been developed and the, the calibration data are needed for the validation and calibration of it. Results obtained so far show that the city of Artena is characterized by a relevant crossing traffic. And after the calibration, different solutions could be designed for the, the congestion. In general, this approach can be worldwide usable suitable because it is based on a general and replicable uh, framework and it can be used as a guide for the local authorities in terms to design and implement smart mobility application. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you, Azura, for the presentation. There is some question on the floor. Um, yes, Can I, yes, thank you Azura for uh, the good presentation and um, I just uh, some curiosity, not a real question mm -hmm. and um, I, maybe I missed something, but I don't remember what kind of sensor you do you plan to use or will uh, or have you use it to um, to sensing the city and, uh, and um, uh, machine flow and also uh, the... Um... Okay, uh, I just tell uh, about high um, um, cameras uh, and drones, but of course I'm not technic uh, technical <laughs> engineer in this uh, uh, field, uh, we are studying the um, uh, sensor. We are um, pro we are designed to buy cameras uh, that can allow to have a good recognition of vehicles without to um, to select the um, I don't know the English term to tell targa the code of the car. Okay, okay. just to recognize the kind of uh, the typology of the icon and the to tracking the um, trajectories of pedestrian and uh, cyclists so just to have a good recognition recognition and classification of this kind of uh, users so uh, cyclists uh, pedestrian and vehicles the mm, exactly typology of cameras and drones, actually, I don't know. No, uh, it, it was not the question, just the kind of sensor. Oh, uh, OK. Uh, now we are planning to use cameras and drones, but okay. it depends on the budget, of course. We can use also other technologies, but they are very suitable because can be connected with the 5G uh, infrastructures. So. For this reason, we are uh, we want to use this kind of sensors and technologies. Okay, so the main use uh, of this sensor is a calibration of the model. Yes, uh, is, uh, if I well understand. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. This is okay. just the foundation. We uh, built the the model, but we are waiting for the calibration. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so is there some more question? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Azura, for your very interesting presentation because the mobility, as we all we know, is a very uh, interesting, very important topic for the uh, urban development, territorial development, and uh, and your uh, your study uh, show us uh, how it's possible to uh, to manage the uh, the mobility and to to have 
more uh, uh, decision, more uh, focused on the real problem and in real uh, situation of the city. So, thank you thank for you. this interesting presentation. And I give the floor to Stefano because uh, Mauro or Matsei there is not. So, I think we, we finish with Stefano in <laughs> the last presentation. So we we'll finish a little bit before. Yeah. More time for the breakfast, for the lunch. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm Stefano Pili. Uh, good morning to everybody. And uh, I'm a researcher at uh, Sota Carbo company. And I'm going to show you um, some preliminary results of a project named Urban Abacus of the Building Energy Performance, in Italian, Abacus Urbano Energetico degli Edifici, con l'acronimo AURE. The project aims to develop and test a methodology and some tool to support the sustainable renovation and energy efficiency improvement of the urban building heritage. The project is financed by the Ricerca di Sistema Elettrico del Ministero dello Sviluppo Economico Italiano and involves Sota Carbo and some department of the University of Cagliari. Uh, this presentation focuses uh, on basically on this point. First, a summary of the theoretical context, then a short presentation of the whole project structure with a focus on urban building modeling approach developing in the project. And then, after this more general part, the framework of Carbonia case study and the framework of the geographical abacus are presented. Finally, some further step and uh, the, some critical aspects are pointed. The theoretical background uh, of the project is well known because we are talking about the renovation of the building stocks. That is uh, one of the main European strategies to reach the target of the climate energy package. But even though new technology make it possible to build a narrow, an early zero energy building, or better now, we are talking about positive building, the heritage energy consumption are still high and become every day higher. This could happen because the great part of, it, of the European heritage is old and inefficient, and the renovation process is lower than the growing of the lifestyle energy consumption. For that reason, the European strategy proposes an holistic approach that identifies the lack of shared knowledge between the stakeholders as one of the most critical barriers. Generally, it is a mainly referred to not technical stakeholder, but could also involve companies and practitioners that could not be aware of the rapid development of technologies, incentive the opportunities and renovation potential. We have some tools generally used that are technical guideline and simulation tool, and more recently tools for urban or district context. But the majority of, the, of this tool are addressed to a technical audience and some of them require also specific expertise. As consequences, often the most technical, the not technical stakeholder as homeowner or public decision makers don't have even the baseline knowledge to give the right impulse for a renovation process. Taking, considering this con theoretical context, the base concept of the AURA project is to use the similarity between an urban energy modeling archetypal approach and the typological one adopted to define design guidelines in order to create a sort of geographical habacus of the urban building stocks oriented toward building renovation and energy retrofitting. The methodology has been designed to be integrated on a urban planning process that generally is based on the same base data and adopt a similar special detail and similar tool like GIS tool. The methodology consists of an analysis and representation protocol of the heritage combined with a web GIS portal that I have the main purpose to involve the local actor. The portal contains some, as you can see here, these four layers, 
the portal uh, contains some layer uh, we call it knowledge layer that could be summarized on four groups. First layer is the residential building layer that contains a special representation of the energy performance of the heritage. This layer is based on a urban energy modeling approach and it times mainly to involve directly the occupants of the building in providing information on their home in order to have a suggestion for, for retrofit. The second layer is the geographical abacus itself. It collects and reorders the knowledge of the building heritage, favoring its dissemination to technical and not technical audience. The abacus and the previous layer are strongly linked. In fact, they are basically different representation of the same set of information. The typological study of the heritage, the energy modeling result, and the data from participatory interfaces. Uh, the third layer that you can see here, in, in reality in, in the picture are the, the last layer. The last layer are the layer for the public building. It is uh, basically a super tool for energy management of the public building, but also is a tool to share the value of the heritage and to promote the transparency of the public energy use. In this case, it is proposed a protocol based on energy audit procedure and monitoring sensor network. There are also the context layer that could influence the renovation potential, like could be regulation, uh, urban uh, uh, regulation as well, demography data, urban environmental data, and whatever you want. Uh, this presentation focuses on the framework of the Habacus layer contents and on the framework of the web interface, leaving a more detailed description of the other layer to further publication. Let's see the framework of uh, the uh, urban building energy model and approach developed in this project. Uh, as I said before, the representation of the energy characteristic of the residential heritage is based on typologies and on the energy model at the urban scale and is adopted to make a preliminary evaluation of the retrofit potential of the building stock, stock and also for the single building. An easy urban energy model has been, well, then set up in Q QGIS environment. It can calculate the energy performance of each building starting from, as you can see here, starting from building geometries that could be defined from commonly available, available topographic basis, the typological characteristic of, a, of the envelope and plan system based on local context analysis, and use a simplification of the current standard calculation. In this way, we can obtain some thematics map related to building energy performance issues that could be used to interact with the user of the portal via specific, via a specific interfaces. The interface shows the information of the typological study and the model preliminary result, but asks to answer a questionnaire. This answer will be combined to the model result to generate advice specific for the, uh, the answer uh, received. And then this answer will be used to modify the statistics that are the basis of the urban model and also to update the abacus content itself. Well, now this is uh, the case study. We, um, this is Carbonia, is a southern Sardinian fascist company town. It is founded as a, a support for the coal mining activities. And uh, it uh, would be a perfect case study because uh, about 60% of the building are historical and refers to a fascist company town. So are available a lot of documentation about structure, floor plans, material, etc. Moreover, for more recent building stocks, the base data viability could be considered similar to other Sardinian city. This aspect makes the methodology replicable at least on regional context, but we, we think also a, a more wide context. The first step of the study of the local heritage is the definition of the Carbonia buildings archetypes, the building typologies, uh, it means. The choice of the methodologies 
or the methodology differ by age of construction. As you can see here, three periods have been identified, pre-foundation, the foundation, and post-foundation. In the first period, only one type, the Medau, the Medau house, have been identified. It is an example building derived by studies on local traditional construction technologies. During the foundation period, each building is a real model replicated numbers time. 50 models have been identified and adopting the documentation stored in the conservation urban planning tools. For the post-foundation urban stocks, again, an uh, example building methodology has been chosen. As you can see, the most common post-war types has been identified. For the definition of constructive feature, an expert-based approach supported with a local survey campaign has been adopted. This is, uh, let's see here, the framework Abacus web interface. Uh, in the Abacus, a generic user can consult the map of the building archetype and learn through a structure organized by different level of knowledge from the essential, the essential notion up to the technical requirement. The first page presents a map where it's possible to select a building and access to a summary page dedicated to archetype of the selected element. This is the level one of knowledge for us. This level one is mainly addressed to not technical user and act as a hub to explore the various issues related to the efficiency of the building that represent the other le levels of knowledge. As you can see here, the building element, the element of the structure, the right of the technologies, and the level four is the more technical um, level. It is a similar uh, to technical specification of more common retrofitting technologies. Together, these layers are similar, uh, have a content similar to a uh, building guideline. Now uh, we'll see just uh, a little sample of the beta of the R portal. As you can see, there are three main link, three main section, the public uh, the building heritage, the geographical habacus, and uh, the public building uh, layer. And then there are the link for fulfill the questionnaire. Acting to the link of the map of this, uh, acting to the urban habacus link, the map of the city will be open and there is possible to see typologies uh, and uh, map uh, terms like a typology of age of build. Uh, as you can see here, in order to test the procedure, only a small part of the city has been implemented, but at the end of the, pro of the project, uh, the wall center will be implemented. Then clicking to a building, the typological section, the level two, the level one, what, uh, what uh, I was okay before, is, uh, is showing. The other level of knowledge are uh, still in development now. So only this uh, few section could be available in this uh, in the website. Now, just a quick conclusion and further steps. The, Carboza, the Carbonius case study is still now under development and the main target are the development and testing of the Abacus interfaces, trying to involve some local actor, actors and experts. Now the second uh, target is the definition of a replicable methodology. Uh, linked to this uh, target, there are some critical points that have to be tested careful, carefully, that are the effectiveness of the, content, the, the contents and the procedure and the effectiveness of the procedure of the interfaces. And then the other critical point could be well-defined the relationship between model, questionnaire, and Habakkuk's contents. And then the other careful point that had to be tested is the replicability of the, techno of the methodology because it's very important to, that this kind of approach could be replicated in other cities, at least regional city. Thank you for your attention. 
Thank you, Stefan. And thank you for uh, even to respect exactly the time for the presentation. There is some question about the uh, presentation of Stefano on the floor. Uh, so you, uh, you touch another uh, important aspect. Uh, we we see today we we pass from uh, personal uh, technology uh, about uh, that give us a help to to manage personal disease and personal problem, and then we we saw another presentation about mobility and the last one from Stefan about energy and energy management in the city. So three very interesting aspects of the uh, territorial uh, development in general terms and of course uh, human being uh, development. Uh, so if there is not uh, Mauro Mazzei or something else from this group uh, Armando, Luigi Palma, Massimo De Maria or Oleg Bic I can I don't see in the room and if there are not questions about all the presentation of course uh, I think we, we can uh, um, Stefan, please. I just um, underline what you said before because uh, we have uh, just uh, some some presentation about smart building toward uh, um, health program, uh, like the first presentation, and then we have smart mobility, and then we have uh, smart energy management at the urban level, but also public building. So we have uh, uh, a good luck to a good, uh, a numerous kind of application of smart city, I, I think. Yeah, I, I think it could be interesting to, to join uh, these three different aspects, uh, because yeah. of course, mobility uh, affects energy and even the human behavior affect the energy system so uh, i hope that uh, in the future this different analysis and different studies could uh, join in a, a general framework to uh, better manage uh, the our city our territory uh, because all these aspects are important and influence each other yeah is so, uh, one of the main uh, uh, target of uh, the research in this uh, in this field, I think. Yeah, to change data and another yeah. point is how to uh, combine the data and uh, so uh, have different information and spread the data and the information about all the all, all in all the territory and for all the stakeholders, all the people that live in the in our city. So if it, there are no, com no more cool comments or curiosity questions, I think we can uh, stop the, uh, conclude our session. Uh, I really thank all the uh, presenter, uh, Stefano, Azura and Jessica that give us a very interesting uh, vision about the future of our territory and our cities. And I hope for the, for the future uh, that you conclude your study with uh, uh, maximum success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you. Uh, excuse uh, me, Professor Mundula, before you leave, uh, can I remind you to fill out the form for the evaluation? Of course. Uh, can you uh, send me the form?
Or? Yeah, I can send you in the your institutional mail. It's okay for you. Okay, it's perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you again. Goodbye. Bye. Bye bye.